Good afternoon, good evening, good whatever you are, wherever you are. Welcome to the Bill of Rights Institute's AP US History Skills webinars. My name is Nicole Moretti. I'm a professional development instructor at the Bill of Rights Institute. I'm also a over 30 year veteran of the classroom. Um, I will be monitoring your discussion this evening on YouTube and I'll try and answer any short questions you have on there. If not, we'll let our presenter Daniel pick up on that. Um, we see you guys out there that have been joining us all, all the sessions that we've had. Yay for you for sticking with us um, and welcome if you're new. Uh, hopefully you found out that the Bill of Rights Institute's whole goal here is to just help you feel confident and successful on the AP exams. And so uh, we want you to participate on the chat. We had some great discussion last night. Let's keep that up and remind you to explore some of the Bill of Rights Institute's uh, resources on their website. I dropped in some links last night. Hopefully some of you explored those and I will drop in some more tonight. Um, I also would like to know if any of you have entered or will be entering the Bill of Rights Institute's essay con uh, contest for We the Students. Let me know if you've jumped in on that. April 15th is the deadline. Um, I'd like to introduce our resident expert now, our AP prep guy, Mr. Daniel Jost. He is doing a fantastic job for us. And did you guys know that he's also a 2018 Gilder Lehrman Teacher Guy of the Year? Yeah, is that right, Daniel? Yeah, that's pretty good. You guys don't know how lucky you are to have this guy and he's giving us some great stuff. So let's get things off and running here. Take it away. All right, welcome back people that are back and uh, welcome to those of you new. Uh, and for those of you- uh, You're doing a fantastic job. Hold on here, just having some technical difficulties. All right, let's go ahead and start. So. For those of you new, welcome. Uh, for those of you, welcome uh, back. And for those of you watching this later on, hey, 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 are you jealous you don't get to participate in the chat? Uh, anyways, to start us out, I'd like to just remind you that in the description, we got all sorts of really incredible resources. But the one we're going to use tonight is this document right here. And it's something I kind of put together. Um, and I'll just kind of quickly preview it before we uh, jump into the big topic, which is reconstruction. So these are the key concepts that the College Board has listed in their curriculum guide. And so you will see uh, some of the things you're expected to know. Uh, and then over here, we have some different phases of reconstruction. And before you get all freaked out and go, what? I don't know all this stuff. Don't worry about it. You don't need to know it all. But for me, knowing the full story allows me to kind of pull out the big important details. So um, this is the different phases of Reconstruction, some of the plans between the different presidents, Lincoln, Johnson. Then we got Congressional Reconstruction. Uh, and then we got Reconstruction under Grant. And then we got the end of Reconstruction. And uh, in the latter half of today, we'll be taking a look at some possible essay questions, and we'll be working on the very important skill of argumentation and thesis writing. So if you're doing the DBQ and the LEQ, today I'm going to kind of hopefully prepare you to get at least two points out of the rubric, because you have the thesis, you also have that unicorn point we mentioned uh, at one of our previous sessions. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And what I'd like you to do, if you would be so kind, is in the chat, tell me what you think about when it comes to reconstruction. Let's just say you're at the club, you're hanging out, you're at a pumpkin patch, you're waiting for the bus, and someone says, hey, what comes to your mind when you think about reconstruction? And if you're thinking to yourself, why is this stranger talking to me at the pumpkin patch about reconstruction? Just, you know, ignore that part. What comes to mind when you think about reconstruction? Curious in the chat, anything at all. And while you're kind of sharing your thoughts, I'm gonna tell you why I chose this topic and also uh, kind of give you a little bit of background. So what comes to mind when you think about reconstruction? 
And so one of the things that that made me kind of go with the reconstruction topic is it oftentimes gets overshadowed by the Civil War. I don't know about where you are, but in California, in the eighth grade, you're supposed to learn all the way up to reconstruction. Uh, and then in 11th grade, you pick up where it left off. If you're not an A push, you don't really learn about it. So a lot of students kind of get to the Civil War, maybe in their eighth grade class and then run out of time. And there's a lot of reasons why Reconstruction would kind of get overshadowed. Civil War is a big moment. I mean, take a look at that. That's a lot of people who die. Uh, and if you were to add up the death toll of all of our other wars, it would not equal the death toll that America experienced during our Civil War. And it makes sense. We're actually fighting each other and we're fighting on American soil. And that's one of the things about next week, we're going to take a look at the effects of America's wars. One thing that is important to understand is most of America's wars, thankfully for us, have not been fought on America's soil. So we haven't had that utter destruction. Uh, so I see some people kind of mentioning something, rebuilding the U.S. after the Civil War. I want you to think about some other impacts of the Civil War while we wait for the chat to kind of fill up with your thoughts about Reconstruction. You know, I already mentioned the lives lost, but as was mentioned by Scotchy, uh, the Southern economy is destroyed. The South is basically just laid to waste in some areas completely destroyed. Remember William Tecumseh Sherman rolling through uh, hot Atlanta and all that stuff. You have Republican laws passed. You know, one of the ironic things about the South leaving the Union is they lost the ability in Congress to block laws that Republicans were able to pass because 11 states left the Union. So you have the Homestead Act, the Pacific Railroad Act, and others. Um, you also have, of course, the Union being preserved uh, at the end of the Civil War, which obviously for uh, the United States is a good thing. And perhaps most importantly, uh, and consequentially, you have 4 million people who were previously enslaved are now free. And so it makes a lot of sense that the Civil War would kind of overshadow this period of Reconstruction. But Reconstruction, in my opinion, is the more fascinating part of this story. And that's just my personal opinion. I've never been one of these. There's people that are like big Civil War buffs and they like... Uh, you know, go to every battlefield and know all the different ways the soldiers went. That's not my cup of tea. Um, but the reconstruction piece really fascinates me. Uh, so I see some people talking about the start of industrialization in the South. OK, um, you know, from an agricultural economy, you know, their economy is going to shift in some ways. Uh, I see Maddie talking about the Civil Rights Amendments, Civil Rights Act, and then the end of reconstruction. you got this rebuilding of the South. Um, and then Cornell is talking about reforms after the Civil War. These are some of the questions. And, you know, one of the things that I think gets lost is that this is not a one uh, problem task that needs to be rebuilt. You know, how do we bring the South back to the Union? Do we like put them on a timeout? Should there be a penalty for those people who, who basically left the Union, committed treason? Uh, what do we do about the South? Number two. Uh, what, do we, what do we do about its rebuilding? You know, it's completely destroyed. Number three, what do we do for the newly emancipated individuals? You know, what are we going to do about the four million people who, before the Civil War, were considered property? Because of Dred Scott, we're not even citizens. And then who should do it? Number four, what, should, what branch of government? Should the president do it? Congress, the courts? So the states do it. You know, there's been this battle in American history between federal and state governments. You know, who's going to direct this thing? And so there's a lot to unpack. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that Reconstruction actually happened before the war even ended. And if you look at this map, you will see something that is interesting. And that is the Union had started to get parts of the South under federal control by around 1863. And you could see in the key that the Union by 1863 had all the areas in the yellow, tan, and green occupied. And what that meant was, what are you going to do with those states, such as Tennessee, for instance? What are you going to do with perhaps Arkansas once they are militarily defeated? And so Reconstruction really kind of begins during the war 
under Abraham Lincoln. And once again, you don't need to know every little step of reconstruction. You don't. We're going to go over the key concepts. But what you do need to know is the big picture about how those battles unfolded. The battles between the president and Congress. Um, Lincoln versus more radical Republicans. Or Republicans in Congress and Andrew Johnson. And so how those struggles played out. And so Reconstruction begins during the war. And that's something that a lot of people kind of don't acknowledge. Here's one of the big ideas you should keep in mind. And it's this. Reconstruction altered relationships between the states and the federal government. Clearly, 11 states are being brought back into the union. The federal government is the one kind of doing the bringing back. They're not too happy about being brought back in many cases. And it led to debates over new definitions of citizenship. You know, what are what is the status of African-Americans who were formerly considered no different than property? Dred Scott said they weren't citizens. What is going to be their new status? So not only the rights of African-Americans, but also the rights of women and other minorities. And this is really going to play a role in the 1950s and 60s when it comes to civil rights movements and the use of particularly the 14th Amendment. So that's kind of some of the big things that, that we're going to take a look at. This little kind of chart is kind of what you have in the Google Doc, which if you haven't you know, taken a look, go to the description. It's right there. You don't have to be an expert on all of it. But I wanted to kind of give you a one-stop shop look at kind of the different moments of Reconstruction because it gets really, really confusing. And today, I hope to kind of bring some clarity there, but also like, what could you argue about Reconstruction? And so that's what we're gonna be taking a look at. Now, before we go any further, another big idea that you need to know is these three amendments. And I'm gonna say they're in the framework, so that means College Board is saying they're fair game. Meaning if they test you on the 13th Amendment, you're expected to know what it did, which was abolish slavery. The 14th and 15th Amendment also are in the framework. And so once again, that means they're fair game for the multiple choice section, the SAQ, or any of the essays. Not all the amendments are in the framework. Most are not. And so I mentioned that because, you know, as you're starting to do your studying, um, you're going to want to kind of focus. You don't need to go home or stay home where you're at now and memorize every amendment in the Constitution, nor do you have to try to go through and memorize every president in exact order. But the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment dealt with this period of Reconstruction. And so just to kind of give you a quick little recap, you know, the 13th one is pretty straightforward, although not so much, but for the purposes of our review, it abolished slavery. You've seen the movie Lincoln, where Daniel Day-Lewis puts on a clinic in acting. Kind of a slow film, but really looks at the process of getting the 13th Amendment uh, passed. And if you're going to be in government, it's worth taking a look at because it kind of looks at that, that process of adding an amendment to the Constitution and Lincoln's role in doing that. It abolishes slavery, the 13th. Perhaps the most important one is the 14th Amendment. It's the one that's the most confusing, too because it's ratified in 1868 and it's during the phase of Congress taking over Reconstruction. And basically the concern was Southern states and President Johnson were not gonna do enough to protect the rights of the newly freed individuals and that they were really worried about kind of the South 2.0 forming in government. And so they passed this amendment and one of the most significant things, and, and something that is being debated by some folks even today is, it declared all persons born in the US to be citizens. And the 14th Amendment was a condition for being brought back into the union. This was put in by Congress. You must ratify this amendment if you wanna re-enter the union, which is part of this requirement. And think about the repercussions of that. You know, all persons born in the U.S. are citizens of the U.S. That includes, of course, African-Americans. Basically, Dred Scott, bye-bye. That whole decision there with the, the, the status of Black Americans in America, not, not the case. But it also has ripple effect, repercussions for immigration policy. Um, so that's important. You'll see that a little bit later on. This part is really key, too. 
states must protect under the 14th Amendment rights and provide equal protection of the law and provide due process. Now, I'm oversimplifying it because this is history class. When you go to AP government, which you should, if you've already survived a push, they should give a shirt. I survived a push. Now I'm taking AP gov because there's so much overlap here. But equal protection of the law that is embedded in the 14th Amendment is going to be a key part of advancing rights for other groups, not only African-Americans, women, Latinos, Asians, LBG, LGBTQ community, and others. So the 14th Amendment is going to be a game changer, not in 1868, but later on in the 20th century. And so that's a part of this process. And the other thing is the 15th Amendment. And this one's a little bit more straightforward because it basically says you have a right to vote whether or not your race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Translation, even if you were a slave, even if you were a individual who was previously considered property. Now, let's see who's awake in the chat. What doesn't it guarantee? Anyone notice? 15th Amendment does not address which particular issue. And this is going to lead to the next thing that is in the key concepts. What is not in the 15th Amendment? It says the right of citizens of the U.S. to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the U.S. or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. What doesn't it include? Hmm. Favorite color? Oh, yeah, gender. Thank you, Malik. Gender. In fact, one of the key concepts actually mentions, and look at that, that's there, it's there, it, that they're saying, you've got to know this. The women's rights movement with, was both emboldened and divided over the 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. What the heck does that even mean, emboldened and divided? You know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of women, including uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Gaddy Stanton were abolitionists. Uh, they were fighting against slavery. But when it came down to the 15th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, many of them were like, yo, time out. What about us? And they were, there was division within the women's rights movement, the women's suffrage movement. Many of these women had fought against slavery. And now when it was time to kind of extend democratic rights, women were passed up. And some women chose to oppose the 14th and 15th Amendment because of its denial of gender voting rights. Other women chose to support the 14th and 15th Amendment. And so it actually divided the women's suffrage amendment between those who felt it was all or nothing. You ain't about to like lose us on this. And other women supported it. So that's an important part of the story, too. Um, and Susie B. Anthony uh, and Stanton were kind of faced with this dilemma. Do we support this, even though this does give what we were advocating for, but at the same time, it's ignoring our own personal issue with regard to gender? This one's a mouthful. And I don't want to kind of go through today's session just reading you key concepts. But I want to kind of point out something here that's going to play a very important role when we get to how do you write a thesis. So notice what the College Board says right here. Efforts by radical and moderate Republicans to change the balance of power between Congress and the presidency. In other words, you know, to kind of take over the power, you know, Congress would take over in place of Andrew Johnson. Uh, and to an extent, Lincoln, they, they thought Lincoln was too weak, too lenient on the South, but, you know, he ends up dying. Um, and to reorder race relations in the defeated South yield some short-term successes. In other words, there was progress made because Congress decided to actually address not just the South being brought back into the Union, but also this issue of what are we going to do about these 4 million people who are now free? And it is going to lead to some short-term success. But... Reconstruction opened up political opportunities and other leadership roles to former slaves, but it ultimately failed both due to determined Southern resistance and the North saying, nah, I'm bored with this, moving on. Waning resolve. Put that in your mind for a minute 
Because when we get to the question, I want to show you a little trick that I've been telling people about for years and people are starting to listen a little bit, but it's also, I think, ruining the way we teach this class a little bit too. So we'll come back to it. Let me kind of show you what this means in real life. Remember, some significant stuff happens in 19 or 1867. You know, the Reconstruction Act, which is passed, basically divides the South up into military districts. And you can see those districts on this map and they're in military districts and they're under military supervision. And basically by gunpoint in for all purposes, the Congress is saying you are going to do certain things, Southern states, before you are let back into the union. You're going to create a new state constitution in each state. You're going to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendment and eventually the 15th Amendment. And these are the conditions in which you're going to return to the union. And with the 15th Amendment, which is crazy, think about this. This is huge. This is radical. This is insane. People, in some cases, who were formerly considered property are voting. And not only that, but you get a political revolution and social revolution. Notice what's happening right here. You got these military districts, but in 1868, you have Republicans, which I don't know why this map did it in red. Uh, Republicans um, are getting the election, winning state elections. But notice what happens. It eventually turns blue. Now you might be going, well, why is that a big deal? In 1860, Abraham Lincoln's name wasn't even on the ballot in some Southern states. And now you have largely because of the large amount of black male voters in these Southern states, they're voting in elections and they're voting for the Republican party, the party who is seen as supporting this more radical approach to reconstruction. Now notice though, it is very short lived because by 1876, it shifts back because this vote you know, it's great to put things on paper, 15th Amendment, all men can vote. But, you know, paper doesn't guarantee that rights are going to be exercised. So there's this dramatic change. You know, you have the rise of these Reconstruction era governments. Hiram Rebels is fascinating. He's elected to the Senate in 1870, as well as these other Black senators and members of House of Representatives. He's elected to the same seat that used to be held at one point by the guy who is the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. Imagine that, mind blown. What this dude, a black man, is in the Senate in the seat that was once held by the Confederate president. Like, this is a, like, if we were to stop the story here, radical revolution, this is unprecedented, this is crazy. But remember, there were debates. You know, you can't just say Republican or Democrat because there's debates within parties. You know, Congressional Reconstruction was more radical than Lincoln. Sometimes it's called wartime Reconstruction or Johnson, presidential Reconstruction. And the reason why it's considered more radical is they actually take the step of not only enfranchising or giving the right to vote to African-American men, but they also disenfranchise temporarily many Southern whites who helped out in the Confederacy. Now, here's the deal. There were deba debates amongst Republicans even. More moderates, more moderate Republicans were against redistribution of land, which some people were calling for. Some radical Republicans say, hey, we should give land from Southern plantation owners, and we should give that to these newly freed individuals. There were also some people who said maybe these Confederate leaders should be charged for treason. And that doesn't happen. And that's a key piece of this, key part, key part of the story that there is no land redistribution. And so if you are now free, great, you could vote temporarily, but you don't have a way to really economically uh, survive. In fact, the last key concept I'm gonna show you, as you could read on your own, Southern plantation owners continue to own the majority of the region's land even after reconstruction. Former slaves sought land ownership, but generally fell short of self-sufficiency. That's a really nice way of putting it, College Board. As an exploitive and soil-intensive sharecropping system, limited Blacks and poor whites access to land in the South. Remember, there's Black codes. Black codes are passed during Reconstruction. And during Reconstruction, they try to like deal with them by passing these different laws. But these codes were designed to guarantee a stable labor supply. 
And so these black codes made it illegal not to have a contract uh, or to have a job. You could be charged for vagrancy and then you would be forced to work on, in many cases, the very plantation that formerly was worked by slaves. And this force, the black codes, forced many African-Americans into sharecropping. Sharecropping explodes. And I know someone earlier said something about the South industrializing, and this is the whole new South thing that happens. But by and large, it's not widespread. Sharecropping is going to be the economic generator for most parts of the South, and it's going to be done largely by African-Americans and also by some poor white individuals. And the Black Codes were very much designed to guarantee that it's kind of a, a new form of controlled labor, if not, some would go as far as to say slavery. And then of course, I lied to you, here's the last one. Segregation, violence, Supreme Court decisions and local political tactics progressively stripped away African-American rights, but the 14th and 15th amendments eventually became the basis for court decisions upholding civil rights in the 20th century. Now I wanna kind of hover on this one for just a cool minute. Because you probably know how the story goes, and if you don't, you should. By the 1870s, Republicans even were kind of getting bored. Let's refocus on the economy. Grant was dealing with corruption scandals in his administration. There's a panic. And in 1876, there's an election. This dude named Rutherford says he wins. The other guy, Samuel, said he wins. There's a dispute, and then there's a compromise. And basically, what it does is the remaining troops would be removed under the Compromise of 1877. So therefore reconstruction's over because if the federal troops are gone, the South can kind of do what they will. And that's exactly what happened. Hayes becomes president and then reconstruction kind of comes to an end. And the reality is Southerners react through racist organizations. This organization, the Ku Klux Klan was around before 1877 but there were at least laws and troops in the South to try to keep them under some sort of control. The whole goal of the KKK, a terrorist organization, was to maintain white supremacy and to resist uh, these reconstruction changes. You also have, remember this temporary revolution? Well, when the troops are there, the 15th Amendment can be guaranteed, but when the troops leave, the image of the black man voting proudly Placed by blocking either through violence, such as by the Ku Klux Klan, or by the implementation or literacy tests, poll taxes, or property requirements. States put in place barriers to voting. And this causes a great deal of concern as well. And once the troops are gone in 1877, there's nothing to really stop it from rolling out. In addition, not only are Black people in disenfranchised, but white democratic redeemer governments return to power. Black individuals are forced into sharecropping and you have Jim Crow laws spreading throughout the South. Uh, and I wish there was way more time to kind of go into the details of this, but let's just say the progress is very, very short lived and the South becomes very much a racially divided society. Um, so here's the thing that I want to do right now. First, before we kind of proceed, is there any questions generally? Don't get lost in the, the, the weeds here. And what was Johnson's plan versus Lincoln's? Is there anything like just in general about Reconstruction that I could clarify before we kind of look at argumentation and thesis writing? Curious about how you're feeling. And while you're kind of thinking about it, you know, like I said, this stuff's in here. The main thing you would, what I recommend, and I'm once again waiting for people in the chat to drop a question if you have any, is, is think about how this material down here, how this material here helps you. That's why there's a section called notes, how this helps you understand what these big ideas are. And so, you know, for instance, this idea of the 14th Amendment, equal protection, due process, you know, think about that um, when, when we're done or as you're reviewing Reconstruction, spend some time, Supreme Court decisions, for example, 
that would be a great opportunity to think about Plessy versus Ferguson, which maintain separate but equal. We all know the deal. Never really equal, always separate. So this information is, is there to help you kind of make sense of the big ideas in the key concepts. Any questions, y'all, about reconstruction before we get to the fun stuff, which is how to earn points on rubrics? The real reason we all study history. All right, beautiful people. No questions? Y'all geniuses. So here's the deal. Um, so when I was preparing today's session, um, kind of using reconstruction as our guide, one of the things you're gonna need to do, and I've mentioned this before, is argumentation. Can you make a historically defensible claim? Can you support an argument using evidence? You know, not only do you describe the examples that is, are relevant, but can you explain how specific examples provide evidence for your argument. Like that is a key thing. I mean, that's what so many people don't even do. Grown-ups just say crazy stuff on the internet. They have no evidence and they just kind of get away with it. We can't do that on the AP exam. You could do it in real life apparently, but not on the AP exam. The other thing that I mentioned is this idea of nuance. And this is that kind of complex thesis point. And once again, if it's called the unicorn point, you know it's dumb and you know it's complicated. But basically think about how can you show things are more complex than black or white or yes or no or good or bad. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that with reconstruction as our topic. So here is a question that I wanna take a look at. And I've given you a couple different questions, a couple different ways of, of wording what is in essence the same question. And so it says, evaluate the extent. They love that. They love it. I was going through questions from the last few years. They love the evaluate the extent question to which reconstruction marked a turning point in US society in the period from 1865 to 1896. Now, my beautiful people, people of the internet. What do you think? Scale of one to 10, how hard is this question? 10, oh my God, this is brutal. One, no wait, 10, wait, would it be 10 easy? Can't decide, I'm being indecisive here. 10, you would be able to destroy this question pretty easy. I can, I can knock this out. I could easily kind of answer this question. 10 being your confident level. One being, oh, heck no, I might as well sign up for U.S. history in college right now. Where are you at with this type of question? Keep in mind, you might not have your notes in front of you. What do you think? Hard question, straightforward question. Where are we at? Scale of one to 10. When are y'all going to be like? Uh, negative 10. While you're kind of thinking about it, I want to point out there is the rubric for the thesis. One point. Good seven. Solid 5.5, five, seven, six to seven. Okay. Eight. Gabby, eight. Okay. Rowan's five. She's middle of the road. She's being humble. She's like, you know what? I'm going to Kendrick Lamar this. Be humble. Okay, Ryan at a seven, Malik at a seven. Okay. None of you really wait. No one really at the, 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 the below five. So maybe it's because we just kind of went over a few things. Uh, take a look at the thesis, though, for a quick second. It says, response to the prompt with a historically defensible claim that establishes a line of reasoning. All right. Now, before we kind of dive too deep, and I've, as I've been doing these sessions, one thing I've learned is it's kind of hard to like have you type a thesis up. It takes some time, right? Especially if you're gonna put it on the internet publicly, like hit enter and say, this is my thesis. I wanna show you a couple things. Take a look at this in the context of this question. Just, just take a quick moment to just scan the key concepts. They're on your graphic organizer, so you have them. 
And then if you were to scan these other key concepts for the part where it's about failure of reconstruction, once again, this isn't even the details. This is just the big idea the College Board wants you to know about. As you're looking at these key concepts, think about how they could help you argue one way or another on this question. And one thing I want you to, to point out is, or to, to notice is evaluate this, how, to what degree was reconstruction a turning point? And maybe you don't say, it doesn't say turning point because I haven't seen that too often lately. I was talking to uh, my buddy who does the AP government sessions, which if any of you are crazy and doing US history and AP gov, check out his reviews too, uh, Mr. B. They haven't been doing the turning points too much lately, but they love the continuity and change over time, which basically is another way of saying turning point. What stayed the same and what changed? So you could replace turning point with, you know, to what extent uh, did reconstruction continue? I, I, I don't know. Their wording is always goofy to me. But notice the years. 1865 is the end of the Civil War. Maybe you don't remember that. But, you know, there's certain moments I mentioned last week, certain dates that if you know some of the big ones, it helps you frame the question. 1896. Anyone know what happens in 1896? Off the top of your head, that would be relevant to this prompt. Why would the College Board put 1896? It's a great marker date for a very important Supreme Court case I mentioned just a few minutes earlier, Plessy versus Ferguson, okay? So to what extent did things change? And to what extent did things stay the same? That's basically what this question is asking, okay? Or it's saying to what extent was it a turning point? If you look at these key concepts, just scan them, you scan all the key concepts about reconstruction. Let me show you something I, I discovered when I was uh, at the pumpkin patch talking about reconstruction with my stranger that became my best friend forever. That's my dream, y'all, is to one day meet a stranger at the pumpkin patch that loves history and we just connect. We like vibe. So just roll with this weird thing I'm trying to create in my head. I'm wishing it into the universe. Notice what happens here. All that you're seeing right here, if you take a look, is I just copy paste it. So put quotes around all of them because they're not my words, it's the college board. If you take a look, on one column, you have a bunch of things that show continuity. So for instance, if you take a look, you will see Southern plantation owners continue to own the majority of the region's land. That's in the key concepts. That's a continuity, right? Former slaves sought land ownership, but generally fell short of self-sufficiency. That's a continuity. As an exploitive and soil intensive sharecropping system limited blacks and poor whites, that's another continuity. You're being exploited. Obviously it's better than slavery, but others argued that it wasn't too much of a step above. Segregation, violent Supreme Court decisions and local political tactics progressively stripped away African-American rights. That's a continuity, but ultimately failed due both to determined Southern resistance and Northern writing results. The, the South resisted and the North gave up on it. All of these things that are in the, co the College Board framework, literally, you didn't even have to read the book, and I'm not arguing you shouldn't, says the things that you need to construct an argument. Now, just knowing the key concepts ain't going to cut it. You got to know some details, so we're going to show you that. Here's change. The 14th and 15th Amendments eventually became the basis for court decisions upholding civil rights in the 20th century in the key concepts. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, while the 14th and 15th Amendments granted African-American citizenship, equal protection under laws, and the voting rights. To reorder race relations in the defeated South yielded some short-term successes, opened up political opportunities and other leadership roles to former slaves. All of these are changes. Now, if all you did was write this, one, you're going to get marked for plagiarism and you're not going to get a score. But if you were able to put this in your own words and then back it up with evidence, you are on the way to the unicorn point and a thesis statement. What am I talking about? Well, let's go back to our question. Here's our question. 
I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, and, and some of them may seem like, dude, no one would write that. Well, I promise you, people I know have written this. I'm really proud. I work at a school where not everyone's like, you know, college, you know, educated parents. Many of them are first generation Americans growing up in working class households. We have an average pass rate of above 90 percent and all our students take the test. We're none of these schools that are like, oh, honey, you shouldn't take the test. We work hard and our students do really well. But I am happy to say this is one of the thesis statements one of my students wrote a couple of years ago. And that student ended up making a four. But they thought that this would be good enough. And you would be perhaps not too surprised to find out that a lot of students think that this is a thesis. Reconstruction marked a turning point in U.S. society. I mean, they made an argument, right? I mean, the, it, they, they said it was a turning point. But it's so darn vague, and it has, remember what the, the, the point says, a line of reasoning. And remember, the other thing they say you must not only make a claim that responds to the prompt, you can't just restate or rephrase the prompt. So that ain't gonna get a point, but that's something I've seen more often than not. Students think, okay, let me just throw it back at them and I'm good. Nope, not gonna do it. Here's another example, no point. Better, maybe, during the period. Ooh, now they're doing fancy stuff. They got dates. 1865 to 1896, Reconstruction brought about a lot of change. Oh, that's to the extent, a lot of change, but also led to some things staying the same. Okay. All right. Once again, I mean, they're making a claim. It even looks complex, right? Because they're kind of saying that it did some stuff, a lot, a lot of change, but some things stayed the same. Once again, no point there, no thesis, no line of reasoning. The stuff in red is what a lot of readers see. And this is actually the good stuff that doesn't get points. You should see the bad stuff that doesn't get points. Pictures and tears of 11th graders. These are not what you wanna do because to get the thesis point, you must respond to the prompt with a historically defensible claim with a line of reason. That ain't it. Let me give you an example of something that would get a point, although it's not complex. And let me show you. Example number three, this would get a point. Reconstruction was a major, so qualifying it to what extent, turning point in the US because slavery was ended and the Confederate states were brought back into the union. Okay, I see you example three. They have an argument. It was a major turning point. And the line of reasoning is because slavery ends, which is true, and the Confederate states are brought back into the union. Is it perfect? No. Does it recognize that a lot of bad things uh, happened once it ends or even during it? No. But... Boys and girls, this would get the point on the exam. This would actually be a pretty decent thesis. It would not be historically completely accurate, but remember, and this is very, very important. Some of you probably have really, really amazing teachers that when they grade your stuff, they're like looking at the quality of your writing, your grammar, your spelling, your, your syntax, and all that other English stuff that I don't even know what it means, but I say it because it makes me look smart. College Board ain't doing that. And, and to Brian's point, it does only address slavery. It doesn't address the setbacks, but it's still making a historically defensible point with the line of reason. It would not be in a position to get the complex thesis. And I'm going to explain that in just a few moments, but it's still historically defensible. It's not just restating the prompt and it has a line of reason. That would get the point. Let me give you another example. Example number four, reconstruction should not be considered a major turning point in American society since Southern resistance to change and the lack of federal enforcement to reconstruction laws and amendments did not significantly change the lives of most African-Americans in the South. 
Huh? Has more words, must be better. Not necessarily better, but it's making a historically defensible claim. It's not a major turning point. It gives a line of reasoning. The Southerners resist it. And the federal government basically abandoned it, which meant the progress that they had made, the laws and the amendments are going to not really hold the water that they would. Three and four would get the point, one and two would not. Now, three and four are not as historically complex, but keep in mind, this is considered a rough draft. You gotta realize you're writing this thing in 60 minutes. You don't get the topic beforehand. You're in the 11th grade. You're not writing books about reconstruction era politics. They understand that you, you are just trying to demonstrate you learn some stuff that's relevant. So even though number three, you can nitpick it, you could say, well, what about what about the fact that 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 all these bad things happen and that that you know the rights are temporary? Um both of these could still get the point. Okay, Gabriel, uh, or Gabriella, um, it could be 14 sentences. It could be two sentences. It could literally be at the end of your essay um, to get the point. There is no, there is no, and to Joe's, Joe's point is, 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 yeah, it's basically arguing the opposite of what uh, three is arguing. But they're both, let me come back to this kind of rubric here. It has a historically defensible claim. That establishes a line of reasoning. Now, here's the part I wanna I wanna like hit you with because if you're taking the AP exam in session two or three, you're not gonna have an LEQ unless they've changed it for the 15th time. If you get a DBQ, this is where you're gonna need to write your essay, thesis, complexity point. If you get a document-based question, and most of the documents are showing that reconstruction had a lot of problems. You want to go with the thesis that has the most documents to support it. If you are unable to think in a complex, nuanced manner while you're writing, which is hard, if you can't say it was a little this, a little of that, you feel like you won't really take a position, go by what the documents are showing you. And I know that may seem like intellectually, uh, uh, problematic, right? Like I want to argue what I think is true, but if you have to use a certain number of documents, you want to be able to back up whatever your thesis is. And if the, the, the documents are not showing it as a turning point, you want to go with it wasn't. And so that's important to keep in mind. Now, here's the thing. Here's another one. Um, that does things a little differently. And example five says two points, question mark. And this is what we're talking about in terms of that complex thesis that um, really kind of drives home the, the, the more nuanced argument that sets you up. This alone is not enough to get you the complex unicorn point. But let me kind of take a look at this one. Although Reconstruction temporarily protected the rights of African-Americans in the South, and the amendments established the basis for advancing rights in the 20th century. Ultimately, it was not a turning point since Southern resistance, the rise of sharecropping and Jim Crow laws, and the federal government's failure to commit to enforcing the changes over the long term meant any change was only temporary. And I just typed these up word for word as they were written a couple of years ago. And to Joe's point, yeah, you want your thesis to be in the intro or the conclusion, and really, that's exactly what they're doing here is they're combining elements of example three and four. And you don't have to use the exact examples that were given in three and four, but it's showing here's the thesis point, here's the unicorn point, demonstrates a complex understanding of the historical development that is the focus of the prompt. Explaining nuance, explaining both, and if you take a look, continuity and change. This is showing that it does, for the short term, protect the rights of African-Americans, provides amendments that would later on be used, and there is a reasoning why it's not a turning point because of Southern resistance, the federal government failure to enforce, and the rise of Jim Crow and sharecropping. 
Now, for those of you that are sitting there going, wait, so do I have to mention this line of reasoning? No. If later on, the student, you, elaborate on this, you know, you can't just say it here and then never come back to it. But if you write an essay in which you show documents one, two, four, and five, show that it was not a radical change, but the remaining documents show that there was some change, if you bring that into your evidence, into your narrative, you would be in a position to get both the thesis point and the complexity point in your essay. And so that is something to kind of keep in mind. Let me just show you uh, one other kind of variation of a complex thesis uh, that sets you up. Once again, I want to stress this point very clearly. It sets you up. It doesn't guarantee you're going to get two points because you got it in your essay, go into some explanation of what you're talking about. And one of the things that you'll notice when you look at your documents, and I'm talking about the DBQ, is almost always there's two documents, even maybe sometimes even one, that kind of throw a, a little wrench in what you think is the argument or the position. So maybe five of the documents say it was a great turning point in American history, but then two say, nah, not at all. Or maybe it's an essay about the American Revolution. To what extent did the American Revolution cause political change? And most of the documents say, yes, a whole bunch of political change, but maybe two say, nope, not, not at all. Or maybe for some groups, yes, and other groups, no. Most students are just kind of wired to say it's all or nothing. Most adults are wired to kind of think in those black and white terms. That's not what the complex thesis point is talking to you about. Let me show you one more example, and then I'll kind of take a look at the chat a little bit more closely. Here's example number six. Although Reconstruction failed to permanently protect the economic, social, and political rights of African Americans. So they're kind of getting these categories. And I remember when I read this, I was thinking to myself, why did they put these categories? The question doesn't ask you. Some questions will ask you, but they just kind of put that. They didn't need to put that. Although Reconstruction failed to permanently protect the rights of African Americans, they could have just as easily put. It still marked a dramatic change in U.S. society by redefining citizenship, providing the foundation for constitutional rights used later by the civil rights movement, and temporarily used the power of the federal government to radically transform Southern society and reestablish the Union. They're basically arguing it was more of a dramatic change, but they're also acknowledging it was not a permanent fix. Once again, they have an argument, they have a line of reasoning, and they're explaining nuance by both explaining, in this case, because it's a continuity and change type question, what changed and what stayed the same. If in their essay, they kind of elaborated on all these areas, they would then be set up for two points on the DPQ. And for me, and I hate to say this, but for the DBQ, the hardest thing for me is keeping track of all the documents and how to use them effectively, especially because the rubric doesn't leave you a lot of room for error. So keep in mind, if you can get really good at contextualization, thesis, bringing in outside information, complex thesis, there's four points without even using a document, which I don't recommend. But for those of you that struggle with reading, I mean, let's be honest, some of these documents are like, what the heck are they saying? Can't they just talk normal? You know, you could still draft a really well-written essay that fulfills the rubric goals. Now, I want to come back here really quickly to kind of this. As you're studying, that's why it's so important to understand the big ideas and to understand the things that makes sense in terms of talking about these ideas. You know, you can't just memorize the key concepts. You've got to be able to kind of give some examples that demonstrate how this played out in, in, in real life. Um, so for example, former slaves sought land ownership, but generally felt short of self-sufficiency. You could talk about in your essay, your evidence would be, well, the black codes were established, the KKK was formed, the federal troops temporarily 
you know, enforce the reconstruction policies, the laws, the amendments, but eventually they're removed because of the compromise of 1877 and therefore black uh, Americans in the South fell into sharecropping. You could argue uh, opened up political opportunities because of the 15th amendment, black men were able to be elected into Congress. Here's an example, Hiram Revels, uh, he had the seat that Jefferson Davis, you wouldn't need to go into that level of detail. That shows the Republican Party is winning elections in the South where previously it had not. So when you're studying, and this is kind of what I do um, in the review videos that I have, is I try to align and give you the information you need because what some students do is they learn all the details, but they don't understand the big idea. That's a huge mistake. The other thing students do is if I just study the key concepts, I'm going to be okay. That's a mistake too. So on all these guides, which are on the website, uh, you will see, let me kind of show you here. There is the key concept that most connects to the content. You don't need to know all these things when studying, studying the civil rights movement that emerges with greater intensity as a result of World War II in the 1950s. But you'll notice, and this kind of connects to what we're talking about here, seeking to fulfill reconstruction era promises, civil rights activists and political leaders achieve some legal and political success in ending segregation, although progress toward racial equality was slow. That's a key concept in period eight. Look at right here on the slides and in the video that I have, Brown v. Board of Education ruled separate facilities are inherently unequal. Plessy is unconstitutional. Segregation must end. Reconstruction era promises, equal protection, ending segregation, Brown v. Board of Education, equality was slow. Well, why was it slow? Well, right there, Southern Manifesto basically said, we're not gonna listen to you. Nine black students tried to go to school and were blocked by the governor with the worst name ever. No disrespect if you have a family member named Orville, Orville Faubus. And so on my guides, it has the big idea next to the little ideas, the details that will help you make sense of it. We're almost at the end. Are there any questions that I can help you with before we roll out? We have two more sessions next week. Um, one is the expansion of democratic rights in American society. I think we take for granted that, that the right to vote, and there's a lot of conversation about voting rights right now in places like Georgia, the Major League Baseball is getting into it with different lawmakers. And there's also a session about the effects of America's wars. So hopefully you will join us and you will spread the word on the A push streets for the others. If there are no questions, I bid you good night. And thank you as always for coming. I've posted the link to the Bill of Rights Institute for the re reconstruction information. You can just click on that link and it will take you to some really great stuff. I've also typed in the link to where you can get to the We the Student Essay Contest. Um, some great stuff there, um, good prizes. So please explore the Bill of Rights Institute website. Everything's free, tell your teachers to go there and let's uh, show up again next Monday and Tuesday and finish this out. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good job, everybody.